Hello everybody, I'm John Blunt of Is Good Woodworks here in Seattle. This is our certification video, our first one, for the sliding panel table saw. We use these videos to train our clients who come in and wish to use our equipment to do their own projects uh, with mentoring uh, as a rule. The sliding panel table saw differs from an ordinary table saw. In that, the uh, ordinary table saw, from here to here, that's what you get. This has a sliding panel. The sliding panel carries full sheets of plywood very easily, produces an extremely straight cut, and extremely accurate 90 degree angles. This other piece right here is called the rib fence. That's used primarily for cutting the long direction on a piece of plywood. That would be cutting it the eight foot direction. Okay, you can raise and lower the blade right here. You just turn it with a little handle. And you can lock it with this knob. You can tip the blade with this wheel right here. And it goes a little past 45 degrees. And you can lock it right here. You probably need to know how to turn the saw on. So I'm gonna let you know. This has a lot of off switches. It's got a total of three off switches and one on switch. This is the power. You notice it didn't turn on. That's because this is one of the off switches, which is the one people primarily use. They turn it off by pushing in on this kill switch. When it's pressed in, it won't run. Safety feature. To release it, you have to gently rotate it clockwise and a spring will pop it up. Now it should run. Unless somebody also turned off the main power and also hit this kill switch. There's three of them. So if you come over here to run it and it doesn't run and then you release that and it still doesn't run, you think, well, maybe somebody thought it needed to be turned off three times to be safe. That's main power. The right hand black button underneath this. This is the, uh, is released already, but this one needed to be released. And that's the same rotation and release. Now it should run. Now it's off. You do need to use the dust collector. To operate it, we have a primitive remote called a stick. The first thing you do is check the dust bag, see if it's full. More than two-thirds, let us know. Then you poke the switches right here. Left one is on, right one is not on, unon. And that's it. This saw also has a scoring blade. You raise and lower it by swinging this lever and swinging it back and just put it up and back down. This is the scoring blade up. This is the main blade. The scoring blade cuts first as you travel with your table. It will put a shallow cut on here on the bottom of your board that is in perfect alignment with the main blade. It cuts, runs from the opposite direction, and cuts on the end stroke. So since each cut is pushing upward into the wood, it doesn't chip it. It leaves then a channel for the blade to leave, exit, that will not be cutting on the surface. And so the main blade doesn't tear anything out. Its purpose is that's its purpose. You need it when you're cross-cutting because that's when wood tears out fairly badly. You need it much less often when you're cutting with the grain. So we use it primarily for cross-cutting because it, it dulls more quickly than the main blade. The scoring blade has its own switch. It's the farthest to the right, right here, and it has 
an on button, the black one on the right, and an off button, the red one on the left, underneath this rubber thing. And it will not turn the scoring blade on if the saw is not running. Safety feature. In fact, it won't even stay down. It flips right back up. So you have to have the saw turned on. Typical routine is just that and just that. Now the scoring blade will run. You can hear it. Firm pressure. Now you can turn it off. However, I just turned the saw off. Wait a second. And the scoring blade will not come on. You need to turn the scoring blade on every single time you turn the saw back on. This is the main blade cut, right here. That's the scoring blade cut. And if you look straight at it, you can see how the alignment is perfect. This cuts inward, this comes out of a gap, therefore there is no tear up. Now more about the two primary devices that are used to control the travel of your material as it is passing over the blade. They're designed to do pretty much 90 degree opposite things. This is called the rip fence and it rip in our definition in our nomenclature and general nomenclature with some exceptions is cutting the lengthwise direction depending on the aspect ratio of your board. That fence is designed to do cross cutting which means cutting across the short direction. That is traditionally with lumber, the short direction means you're cutting across the grain direction because that's the way it runs on a board. And a rip is if you're taking a board and ripping it in half lengthwise, except that does a much easier to do with that. So, a fundamental rule for achieving the highest level of control over your material as it travels. The point of control being you want that which will prevent wobble while you're feeding it. When it passes over the cutter, the outcome is going to be the path it takes as it passes over the cutter. If you have something that will make it go in a perfectly straight line, you get a perfectly straight cut. So. You want to then choose which of these two devices is going to correspond to the long side of your piece. If it's square, it's a bit of a toss-up. But usually it's not square. So we will control this rip cut here by using this piece, which does correspond to the long side. So just by definition, look at the cut you want to make and use the tool that has the largest amount of interface for control, the biggest foot, so it doesn't wobble. So this would be, yes, you cut this with the long side. Uh, against that, if you tried to cut it instead with the cross-cut fence, this little surface right here doesn't have very much interface for using the guides to control the travel. So if I try it here, you will see that there's very little. It wobbles very easily. And you will probably cut at an angle unexpectedly. And while I feed it, you run the risk while it's being passed over the blade, you're gonna wobble like that. And that can even cause, it will create the pathway, it will be a crooked cut, and that can even cause the blade to grab it, take over, and throw it in your direction. So. No for controlling a long cut with a tool that corresponds to the short side, a lengthwise cut, generally known as a rip cut. Now I'm going to show you how to cross cut.
This is short side. We're not going to use that. We're always going to use the long side and whichever of these corresponds to the long side. This determines which one you choose, not which side is long, as built into the wood. So logic says you're going to cut this, you would use this fence because you got all of that connection to holding it stable. So you grip it against the fence, more on that later, and you push it and carry it across the saw to cut it off, okay, across the blade like that. And when you're done, you generally want to move it back. And then your, your piece is shorter. Now this is the long side. Because of how much we're removing, it can become effectively the short side if you only have this much material remaining, you're cutting it this short. This is the long side, and at a glance it looks like it would definitely correspond with that, but if you're cutting this much, only this long, off of this piece right here, you are no longer using what's effectively the long side. This is a longer side, in fact, and you've got a lot of wobble, and when you pass it over the blade like that, it's really easy for it to start doing that. And if it's trapped, with a stop lock, we'll get to that later. That can actually bind it so that it throws it. So, it's just something not to do, but there is a way around it. This machine has combinations of control. And I will show you next how to take that cut off of the outside end and have it set for length repeatedly. We call it bump and cut in our shop. Two knobs. Slide the fence back. Here we go. There's a very, very significant difference between how the crosscut control device, the crosscut fence on the sliding panel portion. Uh, relates to the piece of wood while you're cutting. This is a miter gauge from an ordinary table saw and it is used in this relationship right here where were you to move this down and encounter the blade with this, the pressure of the blade that direction is not going to move this and make it wobble and go into an angle. If you are in fact using this one, you're downstream from the blade. So when you reach the blade, it's very easy for the piece of wood to be deflected from the fence. You must be part of the machine. You are the clamp that holds the piece of wood snugly against the crosscut fence. The hands should be directly across from each other to mitigate any problem of accidentally sliding sideways. You need arm strength. That means grip it here, not here, not in this manner. If that thing kicks back at you, those are vulnerable to breaking a joint. This is not. So you put that part of your hand on the wood and the other hand has to fully reach over doesn't even need to encounter the wood, fully reach over and put pressure while you make your cut. I'm going to make a cut now, a partial cut. Now I'm going to make a full cut. I lied. <laughs> Another very important thing to, to know is that you're, you need the leverage advantage against that blade while it's spinning. If you hold it here, you've got a strong grip. It will hold it well. So that's closer to the blade. Now, Lauren, who is the, the camera woman, 
we'll come over and we'll demonstrate together. If I hold it right here, Lauren, would you reach over and pull it? See, it's relatively easy for her to pull it away from the fence because I've lost the leverage advantage of this arm. If I pull it, hold it right here, now I'll tug on it. Two fingers. Yeah, okay. Good, good. So you need to hold it closer. It's actually safe. If you're making a cut, using this stop lock, which sets your length for you, then when you're in the cut, then, and if it starts to move, this line from here to the corner is longer than this line. Therefore, it's putting pressure against the blade. You can see me moving the blade. That, that blade is running at 180 miles an hour with 10 horsepower of energy behind it. With a little bit of pressure, it, it, takes, it takes over and throws it. It'll spoil your cut. You, if you're holding it here, it's less likely, you're not likely to cut yourself. If you're holding it here, you're not likely to cut yourself. But if you're holding it here, that pressure is gonna throw it. Tight grip. The bump and cut works great when you have a long piece and want to cut short pieces off of it because you can use that length for control uh, and it doesn't get trapped. What if you need 32 inch pieces? Eight foot board, we want to cut it into, well not 32, let's we'll see what we got. We'll set this, this is a length control. It's the stop lock. It's the cross cut fence stop lock. So I am going to set this to 30 and one half. Pretty popular dimension for base cabinets. Uh, a lot of the pieces are 30 and a half long. Okay, so we already see that we have a little bit of a dilemma using the stop block to cut that directly in one chop. And you'd have a piece that would be prone to falling in the hole and doing bad things to you. Uh, so you can't, you can't go straight there from here you could conceivably set that up to bump and cut 30 inches, or 30 and a half, and this one to cut 30 and a half. It's a little bit of work you don't need to do. Usually, you don't need to do it. If you're only doing a little bit. If you're doing a bunch, it's worth it. Bump and cut one, and then you can use, and you can bump and cut the second one if you've got enough left over to hold it here. And then the last one won't cut, won't bump and cut. Another way to do it, so that, that would be bump it, cut it, move that new end down, bump it, cut it, and then you've got about this much left over. If you try to put that down there, you don't have any support at all. 30 inches over there and only this much here. So that one would be cut with this if they're set the same. It's one setup. But if you're only doing three of them, you got 30 inches and you've also, or 30 and a half inches and you got about this much extra on the board afterwards. You can just do a quick trick. We turn that on. Finger. Finger underneath this. This is the portion that sets the length from the side of the blade you see right now. If you have a mark here that's beyond this, you know you're going to get enough length out of this piece by moving it down here without letting my finger slide so it's just going to cut it. Put my finger where it's at the blade. Start it underneath this. So that distance was a little longer than 30 and a half. I can now cut this off freehand by just cutting a rough leaf. Do it like this. We are showing the guard not in there. Don't do that. This is so you can see what's going on, okay? Everybody, um, no, don't leave the guard out of your way. I just can't teach this without having you look at it. Okay, so what we cut? We got a fresh 
clean 90 degree cut here. We got an end that is always considered suspicious. Now this end can now go against the stop lock and we can cut the final cut, final link. And it can go in the done pile. That needs to move because we do not allow chips to sit there while you're making a subsequent cut. There are too many places where they can get jammed up and hit something, spoil your cut, throw, make you lose control, and then the saw throws in. And there's both safety and your, your output that are at risk. So this chip uh, needs to be moved. And uh, choices are, one is don't put your hand there. Don't do that. So it's not really a choice. You need to move it. You can push it with a stick. That's kind of risky and doesn't always work out. You can still throw something. Or you turn it off. That takes way too long to, for the motor to stop. So we've rigged up uh, this system where we blow it. We have an air blower hooked on the trash can, which is also where you put your short pieces of trash. That means by put, putting it where, where we set it, you can usually reach the air from this side, stand off to the side, and blow it out of the way. Now, this is the piece that was, was here when we bump and cut, or when we, when we rough cut this one with the finger mark. Then we move this down and we cut it clean here. Both ends got cut, which is always done. Raw ends don't count. Now we've got this left over and we have one good end automatically created when we cut this off first, cut this off. But I'm gonna pretend that we've gotten rid of the bump and cut location. No, we never use a bump and cut location. This needs to turn around so the one good end pushes the the only good end pushes against this stop the same way that one was. Then we turn this on. And we've produced another one. Exactly identical. And we've got one piece left over. Remember, you're gonna have the guard on in the real world. This is a good end. That's a wild end. So it goes straight over and you cut that off. Next, loading a sheet of plywood onto the saw, straight lining it and ripping it. To load the plywood, we need to lock the sliding table so it doesn't scoot out of the way and, and your plywood encounter the blade. To do that, you use this knob at the bottom end of the sliding table. You have to, to rotate it counterclockwise a fair amount of turn. That will, in, will free up a pin down at the saw end that will fall into a detent, and it is now locked. Loading it when it's leaned against the wall is a lot easier if you pick it up right. From this distance to this distance, if you get your hand right in the center, and start tipping it when it's leaned against the wall, you aren't really lifting very much of anything. And when it tips far enough, it just falls horizontal onto your, in this case, right hand. You gotta lean over a little bit, and then you can easily set the piece down across onto the two separate parts of the sliding table and lower it toward yourself, and then spin it into position for the straight line step. Straight lining is set with the saw very slightly hanging off the sliding table so an edge will be cut. You're taking advantage of the linear bearing of the sliding table to create a true straight edge on raw plywood, which sometimes is not that straight, and we often have breaks and stuff that you just want to clean off. Just a little bit is uh, kind of needs to needs to be quantified, and uh, what this saw has on it is a line right here that we put there for convenience, so that you can tell 
where you're cutting, this line corresponds to this side of the blade, which means that if you put this right to that line and straighten it up, you will just barely brush this edge. So if I pull it over about a quarter inch and I'm showing something like five eighths of an inch right there, then I will be cutting a quarter inch off of it, which is a good for general purposes. This is now set in position for straight lining. Unlock. Good. The straight lining is done by using the crosscut fence as your control device, which is a slight vari uh, violation of the use the long side to control it. It's designed this way. Uh, and you, so we, we have to use it that way because it doesn't work otherwise. But we also have the linear bearing as another factor in controlling the travel because you're going to move the whole thing forward uh, while pressing down onto this, the, the, uh, the table of the sliding table. However, you have to put a lot of pressure against that crosscut fence because that's what's doing 90% of the control. Uh, if you have high strength extendable rubber arms, you can reach over and squeeze it like we did before. You don't. They provide us with this clamping clamp-on device that you can set on a rail on the machine right here and you could push down and pull toward you and then push with your other hand. That's tiring and you only have one hand available so almost everybody chooses to sit on this and use their butt as a third hand while your, your two real hands provide the pressure, a little test, a very slight test to see if it wobbles. If it's solid, then you can walk with it. And you're like seated in your car. Nothing changes except your legs are walking you through the cut. Beautiful straight edge. Now we need to pull the stock away so it doesn't hit the blade. Then return the sliding table to the beginning point. And then we're ready to rip. We first have to set the rip fence to the width we want. This is a cam lock that holds the, uh, the fence in position. Uh, locks it to this bar. You need to loosen that in order to be able to move the rib fence to where you want. I'm going to do a relatively narrow rib here. So I am going to set it to six inches. This, this is a gentle way to turn it. It engages to, to this bar and lets you turn it a little tiny bit more easily than tapping. Once you're there you lock this. To get precision, I need to show you how what your line of sight is uh, to the scale and the gauge. For precise width setting, we have this calibrated uh, so that if your line of sight is in this plane right here, your eye is directly above that so you barely see that face, then you line up the line on the indicator directly above the line on the scale so that it hides it universal through our shop. So I'm going to line my eye up against that and I'm going to do that fine cranking till I, <coughs> till I have covered the line for a six inch cut. Ripping on a sliding table panel saw is both easier and different than ripping on a, an ordinary table saw. The biggest difference is you have the sliding table to hold your wood up. On an ordinary table saw, since you don't have that, you have to hold it up, which means you have to stand back here. And you have to then, from back here, master keeping it tight against the fence. With a sliding table panel saw, you can stand right here. And we're going to run it 
without cutting for the demonstration that is then just move forward by walking your hands not you then when you when you get close enough so that you are maybe a hand's width away from being finishing your cut you have a push stick prepared and ready to push on it the rest of the way and then your left hand has to stop pushing against the fence because pretty soon you're going to push this into the blade. You don't want that. If this is, needs to be positioned halfway between the fence and the blade, if you go here, it's going to swing left. If you go here, it's going to swing right. And the very end of your cut will be a tiny bit off. If you put it right in the middle, release the left hand pressure and keep pushing, it'll finish the cut straight. Perfectly straight, six inch piece. For shop purposes, solid lumber needs to be made flat, straight, and two dimension for success. One step in the process is straightening an edge. And that's usually done with a jointer, but the, with the panel saw, you can straight line instead by clamping it to the sliding table. We have in our shop, these two different clamps right here that each operate one end and clamp it down. This one goes last, and this one goes all the way down to the end right here. Then it's clamped while holding it against the cross cut fence. With this block. Next, the board is slipped under this clamp and it has a knife edge that you can catch it with and it will not go sideways. This one. goes in this way. You have to be downstream from the blade. And we'll reset this. And then this one simply clamps downward. It's now secure. And it's hanging out just a little bit. So it'll trim that edge. I'll do that now. There. You don't have to, you can push it from anywhere. With this saw, you can do a form of bevel miter. It's called a waterfall fold, where the grain just folds and goes down. Uh, and this is, is done in the same way that you do any other cross cut, but you have to pay attention to holding the piece down, because if it starts to lift, it actually cuts further this way because the blade's not straight up and down, and you get a curve on your cut. So I will do this cut now. I'm gonna do a firm grip. That's rather short. Now that you've seen how bevel miters work, you may be tempted to make a cut like this. Don't. This can be very, very dangerous. The reason for that is because you are trapped underneath the blade. This opening is narrower at the top than it is at the bottom. So if it should start to lift, especially at this part of the cut, the back teeth will bite right into it because they're being pinched here. And they will lift it, the blade will hold like that, a very long way, 
and it will throw it and it can accelerate it to uh, 180 miles an hour if it really gets a grip on it. So, and all it takes is a little bit of lift. You can see here, now if it starts to lift, see the teeth? See how they are grabbing it? And they can pull it up and pinch it exactly like that. And it will grab it, it will shoot it. So this is a cut you do not make. On this particular machine, you have no choice. You can't do it at all. On other machines, if the fence is on this side and it starts to come up, it's coming up into an opening that's larger and that is how you safely make a bevel rip. So there's your miter fold. And that's the end of the video. Thank you very much.